The WOR time now is 11.15. Time for the Gene Van Dyke Shepherd Show. Give you a brass figlicky with bronze oak leaf palms. Uh, it's hard to believe. Was uh, was there ever a person really called Blue Baron? Or is this another one of those fleeting things that go through the night of the skull? You know, like a, a quiet little <laughs> imaginary bat that comes fluttering around that eternal cave of the Blue Baron. I'll award you the brass figlicky with bronze oak leaf palms if you can tell me the name of the star singer with the Blue Baron Band at its very peak of... Oh, let's go, gang! Oh, yeah. Oh, look at it now! She's got eyes of blue. I never liked broad eyes of blue, but she's got eyes of blue, and that's my weakness now. Oh, she's got... Dimple cheeks, I never cared for dimple cheeks, but she, she's got dimple cheeks, and that's my weakness now, oh my, oh my, oh my. I'm really doing great here, it's a very good thing, if, would you like to hear the second chorus of that, it's obscene. I've never read uh, about something that, you know, she's, uh, that's just a very interesting story. Uh, if you'd like to hear the second chorus, and if there are enough of you out there that raise your hands, I might be tempted to send it to you by magnetic telepathic projection. And Addie's even got a better beat. Let's hear a little more of this. Oh, she's got Bill and Coo. I never liked to Bill and Coo, but she likes to Bill and Coo. And that's my weakness now. Oh, my. Oh, oh. Quack, quack. Rock, a duck, a duck. Got to have a little levity here. I'll never be accepted the way Edward R. Murrow is accepted. You cannot hear Murrow blowing a nose float in the middle of an editorial on Indochina, even though it might be very apropos and say a devil of a lot more about Indochina and the whole mess than anything he can say in the editorial. Oh, let's go. I, I think we're on the right track here. Oh, uh, quack, 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 quack. Uh, all right, all right, all right, now, wait, 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 wait. Hold it, hold it. This is the, this is the point where I should sing the second chorus. And uh, I don't want anybody in Staten Island to misinterpret the second chorus. You see, uh, there is a great deal of difference between, well, uh, a form of medieval 
blending into Renaissance art and what we call today trash. There's a big difference. Uh, uh, you know, that's a, that there's a world of difference, believe me, in the east side, between the east side art houses and 42nd Street. Even though the pictures are the same, and what I'm talking about is the same, there's a world of difference. You want to hear it? I better not, you know. It's a funny thing. Uh, there's a lot of nervous people out there, and, and uh, this, is, this is 1963, and in a few minutes it's going to be August the 1st. That's, uh, well, that's the flowering period of the yeast. You know, there was, a, there was a phrase out in the Midwest that had to do with the flowering period of the yeast. And, uh, you know, last night, you know, we did a, a story about fishing. I didn't tell you about the phenomenon which they call the flowering period. Uh, no, 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 I want you to listen very carefully to me because cause it isn't very often that you're going to get a chance to, to touch nature in its infinite glories and infinite rottenness. Oh, boy. Uh, nothing is rottener than nature going full blast. In fact, uh, no, that's true. I don't know whether you've ever been in the salt marshes of Jersey at 4 o'clock in the morning going east, uh, downwind from Secaucus. You would know something about nature <laughs> going full blast. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Oh, uh, boy, I'll tell you, some, there's some days when it takes the paint right off your car. You'd be, you'd be surprised. What do you think it does to your teeth? Yeah, what do you think, uh, believe me, what do you think, what do you think uh, Secaucus does to your lungs? <laughs> and more than that, what it does to your view of existence. But I'd like to, I'd like to, if I may, uh, briefly here, uh, say that uh, last night we we talked about a Midwestern fish called a crappie. And... Um, well, no, I'm sorry. The, the, the crappie is a small, edible fish. Barely edible, but edible. I mean, uh, how many of you, just raise your hands out there, how many of you know what it's like to lash into about a two-and-a-half-pound uh, well-done and well-prepared catfish? Now, I'm talking about a catfish. Uh, there is no there is no fish on the face of the globe that that even remotely approaches the catfish for pure succulence. And the New Yorker here hardly ever runs in. Oh yes, I'm telling you the truth. Uh, do you know that in certain areas of Missouri, yes, they do throw them away, and that's what's so sad about it. Yes, most people do, uh, because they don't know anything about what constitutes uh, food, really, in a way. Uh, I suppose that if you had never been told that the lobster was a fantastic uh, thing, Cal, you would throw him away because of his ugliness. There are a few things more ugly than a lobster while he's lobstering. Now, when the lobster uh, is found, say, at some place like Oscar's over on 3rd Avenue with his guts out and with uh, the proper... Oh, boy, there's one thing about a lobster. Uh, raise your hand, those of you who know what the tamale is in a lobster. Oh, 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 oh boy, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. There's a very few, very few thrills on the face of the earth can even come near that. Would you agree with me there? I'm sorry. I separate people into the sheeps and the goats, so the lobster eaters and the non-lobster eaters, and boy, I find that the, that, that the believe me, there, I would say that there are more non-lobster eaters in the John Birch Society. Uh, <laughs> it's a funny thing. It's all, it's all part of the parcel. Uh, that uh, you can measure man many ways. And while we're, while we're on the subject of, uh, of measuring men, yes, uh, while we're on the subject of that, uh, there are certain places in the, in the Missouri Valley, for example, where, uh, particularly in, in, uh, the southern area of Missouri, down around the Ozarks and, and, uh, places, uh, not, not too far from the Missouri River and the Arkansas River, where as you drive along, you will see little stands advertising Catfish burgers. Yes, exactly the same way that along here. It's pizza pie, you know, pizza, uh, pizza and root beer. Well, uh, you, you, go, you go down through that area, and there is, is, a, is a catfish burger. Let me tell you what they do with a catfish burger and how to prepare a catfish burger. If you, if you are fortunate enough to catch what we call a bullhead or a catfish, let's say he's about a pound and a half, two pounds, that's about right. First thing you've got to do is skin him. Now, I don't know what, whether I should tell you how to skin a catfish here to know that they are not scaled. Catfish and bullheads, uh, fish of that, that uh, family, do not have scales. They are skinned. Uh, they do not have bones the same as, say, a bass or a perch or a pickerel or a pike have. They have more 
the same kind of bone structure as, say, close to a shark. They have more of a cartilaginous structure. It's not the same. Now, you take a bullhead. I better not go into the details of skinning a bullhead, except you do it with... No, it's not very... It's very easy. It's done with a pair of pliers. You just... If you know how to do it, it's, it's, it's easier, believe me, than, than zipping a pair of Brooks Brothers slacks. Just zip, off it comes, just like that. The skin all oh, just comes off real good. Just zip, like that. And there is that beautiful fish there, and he looks different from other fish when he's skinned. There's a certain... A certain fleshy meatiness. He looks, uh, he really does, he looks like raw breast of chicken. Just the way it doesn't look like fish. Then you pop this son of a gun into a, a lukewarm pan of heavily saturated salt water. You, you soak them overnight in this salt water. And then by the day, the next day, you take him out of that salt water and you dry him down. And then after that, now, now listen carefully, after that you take this fellow and you dry him down very carefully. And then you dip him in a mixture of very thin raw egg with a little cold water mixed in it, just a little thin, very thin there, you see. And you, you also cover him with a very thin coating of cracker crumbs, a little salt and a little pepper, and you fry him. Don't ever broil him. The catfish is never broiled. They're fried, for God's sakes. There's a big difference. You, you fry him in used butter. <laughs> uh, you, you, yeah, this is a, or, or even better than that, you fry him in bacon grease that's been kept under the sink for about a month until it's ripe. Oh, boy. And, and you just, you just, believe me, you just fry this guy until he's golden and brown on one side. You flip it over on the other side, and there is nothing like it. There's nothing in any of the seafood restaurants in New York that can touch it. There is a specific quality that the catfish has. Okay, now this is not a nostalgic program about catfish. However, it, it does have to do with, uh, with a, a, a kind of concept of living off the soil which all of us secretly are prepared to do. Because after all, no matter how hip we get, you can be Henry Luce, you can be Mortsall, you are still a creature of this earth, even though you may be Audrey Hepburn, and you're making celluloid love to Cary Grant. <laughs> it doesn't make any difference. You still have blood. You still have those little toenails, which are vestigial remnants of talons. You know that, Eddie. You still have those two little sharp teeth called canine incisors. Oh, yeah, you still have them. When, when Audrey grins on the screen there, there are those little two sharp cutting teeth. You know, she's no different from the rest of us. Oh, no. She can gnaw close to the bone if she has to. Uh, every one of us are, are part and parcel of this world of the predator and the carnivore. And so I didn't know... Uh, speaking of carnivores, this is W-O-R, A-M, and F-M, New York, in this fantastic jungle that we're living in. And while we're on, the, uh, on that kick, we might as well... I, I, I've been kind of debating about telling this story. For the squeamish, you better get out. Uh, for this is the disclaimer, the kind of disclaimer that they say somebody like Charles Lamb would do before one of his essays, or yes, even in some cases, uh, Jonathan Swift. He'd say, for those who who don't want to look at the way it is, get out. Please leave. Don't don't uh, don't uh, get mad if if you suddenly run afoul of all the stuff that happens and get angry. I didn't invent it. <laughs> Your chance to escape is now given here. WABC is now playing the number seven. Fantastic silver dollar hit. So you get down there. You don't want to miss that. You've only heard it 37 times in the last 10 minutes. You want to make it 38, don't you? And set a new record for yourself at least. Get down there, man. And believe me, you almost forgot what time it is. Get down there. They're telling the time now. The weather, the temperature, it's all there. Oh, oh boy, you're missing out on what's going on. Excuse me. You get carried away. That's so exciting, the world. Uh, really is. But um, I'm, I'm this kid one time, see. And I'm sure that we've all had this experience, or at least a parallel experience, uh, I'm this kid, and Flick, who lived about two or three blocks away, now the, the town that I lived in was a town that was, the way many towns are, even now, sort of half suburb and half jungle. Now, yes, that's right, half jungle, <laughs> half suburb, where you had houses, and you had swings, and you had snowball bushes. And you had kids flubbing around the backyard next to the garage. You had guys squirting the lawn. And then a couple of blocks away, there would be this vacant lot with uh, the eternal underground fire burning in it. I had an underground fire there that burned for over a thousand years, they said. Yes, they said there were dinosaur bones down there burning. And yes, they did. And they also said that there had been many kids in the past who had been swallowed up 
if they played too deep a right field because uh, this big fire was burning underground. Did you ever see an underground fire? None of you have ever seen an underground fire here in New York? Of course. This is a fire that burns underground, literally burns underground forever. And uh, the whole field is kind of smoky and it smells funny. And once in a while a little puff of actual smoke comes out of it. And if you walk over near it, you can feel the ground is very hot. And if you, uh, the, the, the earth gets burnt. You know, burnt earth has a sort of ashy quality to it, like old cigarette ashes all piled up with somehow grass growing on top of it. And if you step hard, you go up to your ankle and you get the most fantastic hot foot you ever had in your life. Fantastic. And a great puff of smoke comes out and you know where hell is. Hell is very close. It's right past Mattingly's store <laughs> down there. And when they talk about those fiery furnaces being stoked, you have a feeling that you're over one of the hot air registers. And if you listen quietly at night, you can hear the screams of the damned souls as they're being fed into that great big clinker oven. Just going like that, you know. Just a fantastic clinker oven, and you're, you're, you're a blocking away. Well, so you got the scene. Uh, about every couple of blocks, there is a, a tangled undergrowth of a vacant lot where there are trees and there are garter snakes and there are toads and there are old bicycle tires and there is poison ivy and it's like a jungle. Well, next to Flick's house, there was a jungle that extended for about, oh, say, for about a quarter of a mile. A real jungle, you know, where, where just the kids knew the underground paths. The grown-ups never went in. And kids used to scurry in and out of the... And they have caves and stuff in there. And there were all kinds of wild things would go on in there. But, but uh, it was a kid world. Well, next to Flick's house, Flick decided one day to build a house. Now, kids have always had a desire. I guess it's... it's partly based on the, the thing that we all have, and that is to escape the family, to get out and make the scene on your own. Uh, we're, we're an odd creature, really. We're, we're partly herd animal, like the cow, and the other part of us, which is a, a mind part, not really a physical part, is a part that wants to fly to the moon forever, by yourself. So which side is going to take precedence? Well, of course, naturally, the cow side takes precedence all the time because being with the herd is, is very comfortable. You know, everybody stands around and chews and spits once in a while. And, you know, uh, I don't know whether you've ever stood in the middle of a cow herd, a herd of cows at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's a very peaceful thing if you don't get stepped on or other things on. Uh, a lot of things go on in a herd of cows <laughs> that you don't see in those paintings, those Victorian paintings. We used to use them for second base. They were very good for second base and third base. Although many times we found they were a little large for home plate, the kind of, <laughs> we had very strict rules in our league. But uh, oh yeah, guys used to take them and sail them around like you know they sail uh, beer can tops. You know that was very good. <laughs> you get hit in the back of the head when you're riding a bicycle with one of those things that'll decapitate you and also change your view of life forever, particularly femininity. So you know you get one in the back of the head. Well, uh, it's that's the kind of existence you know, and everybody's pretty close to the soil. And Flick and about three other unknown kids who were from some other part of town built this house. Now, it was built out of tar paper, and it was built out of uh, tin. Any kind of metal that a kid finds around is called tin. It was built out of tin, tar paper, old wood, uh, various other things. And it began to take shape about, oh, about 250 feet to the east of Flick's house in the middle of the deep woods. Well, he finally finished this thing. Well, you know, finished. It was just a little shack, it was a little thing there. And we had a Coca-Cola sign over the door, you know, the, the pause that refreshes. We thought that was very funny. <laughs> it was all kinds of innuendos to that stuff. You know, we had, uh, kids have a very basic sense of obscenity. And uh, they hit each other and yell and hit each other on the elbow. They think that they're the first ones that have discovered the S-E-X principle of life. Well, there is this little house. Now... I don't know whether this was an early pad or not. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm inclined to think that there was some relationship between this little shack and a pad. Uh, a pad is not an apartment, you know, a pad on McDougal Street. It's not a house. It's a pad. It's a place where kids hide and do things they shouldn't. Uh, and they all, yeah, it is. It really is, you see. And they'll always be kids, even if they're 74 years old. If they're living in a pad, they're kids that are doing stuff they shouldn't, and they know it, see, and so that's what makes it so great. They even have to write books and say, you know, big, long books on how, how what they're doing is really the beautiful, true, and, and final essence of the spirit of man. 
uh, although that's another hang-up. We'll go into that later. However, Flick's little place, because it was in the woods, it was not a tree house, lent itself more to the fermentation of true crime than any other place I've ever been involved in. And it was on a hot summer night, just about this time of the year, roughly the middle, well, I'd say a little later than this, about the middle of August, that the great potato mystery took place. And I don't know whether to tell you this or not, because it's kind of, oh, it's very discouraging. Well, here, here it is. We would gather there, and once in a while, uh, we would get, we would get the, the uh, permission of the various authorities to stay at the shack. It was called Stay at Flick Shack. I'm going to stay at Flick Shack tonight. And, of course, the, the mothers, they, they never have. There is no concept. Now, I know this to be a fact. I know that, that if any of you adults out there think you know what your kid is thinking, forget it. There's no concept of what, of, of the, the life, the, the, the communication between the adult in a family and the kid is not. It just doesn't exist. It really doesn't. And on the other hand, kid, if you think that your old man has not been party to some pretty shifty deals in his time, forget it. I mean, he's got a lot of stuff that he's got hidden way back there in the coal bin in his mind that he never wants to drag out, nor does he ever drag out. And if he ever hears me talking about him, he's, oh, this guy's a nut. Turn him off, will you? Well, because... And the closer you get the home plate, the more you know that you're beginning to tag where it hurts, you know, down there at the bottom of the tooth. Well, I'm, I'm a kid, see, and there's Flick and Schwartz and me and Bruner, and we are now down at the shack. And it is about 8 o'clock at night, and this little place, and, and we had built about five bunks into it. Now these bunks were made out of two by fours, and we had uh, we had made we had made ticking mattresses. We were all Boy Scouts, remember that. And so Boy Scouts are always making things like ticking mattresses for camping, that kind of jazz. And we had made them, and here is our place. Now Flick has a hot plate in there, and the whole idea of going into this place was to kind of live an existence that was total, that had no relationship to Flick's house or my house or Schwartz's house or Bruner's house. And we were always going to make our food there. That was the whole thing, was to cook there and, and live there, literally. Well, now, there is a kind of dish that has a mystical attraction to all males. I don't think it has any attraction at all to females. Uh, maybe females never even heard of it. But it is a dish called hunter's stew. Males know about this. Hunter's stew. Now, doesn't that sound great? Just the name. I'll, I'll re repeat it again to all of you guys who have a charge account at the Four Seasons. Hunter's stew. Well, hunter's stew does have a certain wild quality of exultant, very just exultant, uh, passionate excitement. It, it bespeaks of the wilderness. It certainly doesn't speak of ladies or mothers, or chicks. It, 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 it's grimy guys covered with beards, with bloody knives, hacking their way out of the wilderness and making it go. You know, the smoke and the steam, and they're all sitting around eating hunter's stew next to this roaring, raging stream. You know, that's, that's the concept of it. Well, we're sitting there about 8 o'clock, and, and Schwartz, who was the imaginative one of the crowd, uh, Schwartz was the guy who was always, uh, always bringing, there's always one perpetrator in every group. And the others are executors or followers. There's the three different groups. Yes, executors, perpetrators, or followers. Now the perpetrators, the guy said, hey, what do you say we? Now that's the perpetrator. The executors are the guys that say, wowee, that's a great idea, Charlie, let's go. And the followers are the, 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 the crowd you hear in the background who don't say anything. You just see them go <laughs> move along with it. You know, they, they're there. You know, they're in the mail room. They're all these other places. They're there. Well, and it, it's very difficult to know who is the most, well, guilty in any, any great crime. Now, now, it's very difficult to know whether Eichmann was guilty, I must say, because was he a follower, was he a perpetrator, or was he uh, an executor? In which, well, what is the different types of guilt? Who knows? So we're sitting in the pad there, in that, little, in that little joint, and we can hear out in the woods, you can hear the crickets going. Uh, crickets begin to slowly tune up, and there is a, a, a quality to a cricket as it approaches particularly fall. Once you get past July 4th, are you aware, Ed, that the cricket has a different sound? Yes. The cricket has now observed, even though man has not observed, 
that the days are shorter now and there is a slight chill in the air at 4 a.m. that did not exist, let us say, July 16th. And the cricket begins to call that out to the world. Now, kids are, are somehow in tune with that. Adults aren't. They're all down at Jones Beach, and they're all hollering around with a beer and watching the Yankees and stuff. But the kid, being much closer to an animal, vaguely knows about these things. He feels the itch, the desire to dig a hole, the desire to cover it over with sand and to pull himself in after it. Oh, yes, this is the cave syndrome. Caves are rarely ever built, you know, in the middle of summer, Eddie, by kids. They're built usually in the fall. Are you aware of that? Yes. People have made studies of this. The cave digging digging instinct of children. And so kids will start to dig caves right after the 4th of July, right about this time of the year, August. So kids are out there looking at the ground right now, right now. But there's some kids saying, you know, yeah, yeah, let's build a cave, Charlie. He doesn't know why. Why didn't you think of it two weeks ago? Well, it is now. The moon is slightly yellow. There is a peculiar quality to the sky. There is a certain brassiness to it. And within a, a reasonable length of time, the rattle of ice will be heard throughout the land. And the kid is aware of it. Well, we're sitting in in this little shack next to Flick's house. It is about 8 o'clock at night. And Midwestern twilights go on forever because of the flatness of the ground out there and the quality of the air, which does not have the sea quality that you have. You have very quick twilights here, you know. Very quick uh, sunrises like you have at sea. You have them here. Out there, uh, the the sun is down and the, the air is lit sometimes as late as 10 and 11 o'clock. It is still light enough to read. Uh, Dawn comes up equally slowly, and there's all kinds of strange melding of colors out there. And so we're sitting in this long twilight, and Schwartz says, I quote, How about let's make it a hunter's stew? Well, four of us slobs sit there and look. Hunter's stew. The crickets are outside chirping. You can hear the tree frogs chirping away. It's getting darker. And that little boiling thing that happens inside, I cannot speak for women, I can say that happens inside of men, Ed, when they look at the dark trees, when they look at the rocks, when they look at the deep water, when they feel the wind, that little, funny, exciting, wild a scary thing. It's, it's the thing that makes guys hitchhike all across the country in the dead of winter. It's the thing that makes guys hold on to the front end of a rotten steamer uh, going all the way to Yokohama by paddle wheel. You know, it's that kind of thing. It's, it's the thing that motivated Ahab. You cannot imagine Elsa Maxwell as Ahab. Impossible. Impossible. But you can imagine any man in your block as Ahab under the right circumstances. Well, there it is. And so we're sitting there, hunters still, and the birds are chirping out there. You can hear that that quiet, soft... Have you ever listened to the sound of a wood thrush getting ready to knock off for the night? Unbelievable. They make a very strange sound. Uh, There is... There are about 25 kinds of thrushes. There's the wood thrush, and there's there's uh, there's the thrush that they call out in the Midwest the bark thrush. And this is a bird that climbs up and down the trees. And he literally climbs up and down the trees like a person. He just walks up the tree and he walks down the tree head first. And all the way, he's going... He's pecking in the bark for little wood lice. Yeah, he's going... Well, we called it a bark thrush. It had other names, speckled thrush. I don't know what they call it out here, but it was called a bark thrush. And everywhere out there in that darkness, you could hear little things coming to life. You could hear little bats beginning to squeak and and flutter past the little pad. You could hear you could hear millions of things like, well, for example, do you are you aware that at night, in a wood like that, that's the time when the turtles are moving? Oh yeah, Uh, a turtle is a sun creature. He just lies in the sun during the day sometimes when he's half quiescent. But at night is when the turtle is out turtling. That's when he's in business. And let me tell you, a turtle that is really... Do you know a land turtle? When a turtle 
when he is at his peak, a land turtle is, is pretty nearly as fast as a squirrel. Oh, a land turtle moves like a shot. Oh, boy, they go. Have you ever chased a, a, a land turtle at night with, with a flashlight and tried to catch turtles? Oh, boy, they, they move. They're insane. And you could hear out there in the darkness, literally hear all the night crawlers coming up to the surface of the ground to crawl. Well, here we are, four night crawler types ourselves, sitting there, and we have escaped, you know. Now, how am I to describe the, the connection that exists between the world of the, the night crawlers, the world of the toads, uh, the world of the, of the turtles, and the world of the bats, and the kind of lawlessness that suddenly develops in the, in the deep inner circuit of man. It's like when a guy is out on the bum, Ed, he obviously has a sense of existing, let's say, in a primal way. He's existing as a man who cannot rely on anything else, so there are no laws. I've always had the feeling that there is no law at all in the jungle, none whatsoever, none whatsoever. So if you're going to make a hunter's stew, it's like, well, we got to eat. You know, you become one with the toads. The toads are out eating. The bats are out grabbing mosquitoes. Uh, the, the, uh, the turtles are out grabbing <laughs> mosquitoes and flies and bugs. Everything is existing because it has to exist. Now the kids are in the woods, so we're going to make a, a hunter's stew. Well, now... I suppose if you live in the city, the first thing you would think of would be to go home and get the stuff to make the hunter's stew. That would defeat the whole purpose of the hunter's stew. We are living off the soil. And so we, we were waiting. We are waiting now with the, with the wild, fantastic, uncontrolled excitement, waiting for it to get totally dark. Because within a half-mile radius, there were probably 500 truck gardens. That was where we were going to get our hunter's stew. And so finally, it is 10 o'clock, and we're sitting there, you know, boy, we're looking out, and once in a while a guy hits another guy, ah, come on, Schwartz, ah! And they're batting each other back and forth, and one guy knows where there's some corn, another guy knows where, where the place is, where they got the potatoes, another, another, another guy knows where, where, where Canby, who lived down the street and was the mailman, has his truck garden and has tomatoes going, and they, they were great, you know, and all, everything is all, all kind of things. Like, you know, everybody is preparing. Everybody is preparing like an actor prepares. And now it is 11 o'clock. Well, of course, most of us would have been in bed an hour and a half already had we been home. And as we approach more and more the true state of lawlessness, which is no sleep, no nothing, that's true lawlessness, there is more of an excitement developing in us. Until we were almost out of our skull. I remember the excitement, the wild excitement of those nights in the pad. So finally, it is now about one o'clock, and Flick has his flashlight which he got for selling more Collier's magazines than anybody in the block. One of those big, long flashlights with nine cells, you know, you could sign it with a focusing front. So out we go, and we're, we're going through the woods, and you can hear the bats, and you can hear the frogs and the toads, and we are fanning out, going towards the gardens. Well, I don't know how to put it, really, but a garden lying under bright moonlight in August with the temperature in the low 90s or late 80s, with the mosquitoes and with the bats, with the toads, with the crickets tuning up for fall, it's all just laying there. And the corn by that time was not quite as high as an elephant's eye. I don't think corn ever gets that high in Indiana. It only gets that high in the mind of Richard Rogers. Uh, there was this Indiana corn, row on row of it, along the fence, a little truck, garden and there is row on row of onion onion sets with the little have you ever seen onion sets with the little boxes they use the little it's a kind of a little greenhouse technique these are onion sets and then off to the right a row on row on row of the most beautiful virgin potato plants that you ever saw in your life you know a potato plant is a pretty plant have you ever seen a potato plant there's there's almost an emerald greenness to it uh, I'd say the only thing that comes near a potato plant for beauty is a, uh, a Kalamazoo celery plant in the sun. Oh, a celery plant is just magnificent, beautiful. That, 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 that fantastic yellow, that, that lime green of a celery plant 
in a Michigan celery field with the sun on it for a mile and mile. The tulip beds of Holland can't be prettier. They certainly can't smell as good. Boy, the smell of a, of a celery field at, at full flower is just, oh, it makes your eyeballs pop. It just makes you want to weep, you know. Well, we're laying there, and we begin to move forward like skirmishers. And we're scurrying around, grabbing a corn, you know, and guys are pulling. Oh, boy, have you, do you know what kind of sound corn makes when you're tearing it off the stock at 2 o'clock? Ah! It goes, those corn ears scream. I mean, they yell. Ah! And he's crying out loud, Schwartz, what are you doing? Ah! He's tearing the corn off. And you think that everybody and the dogs are barking for miles around. And then you lay there for a while, wait for it to cool off. And everything is awake, you see, at that hour in Indiana, except the people. Everything is moving. Cats, dogs, turtles, frogs, everything is up. And they can hear every sound, you see. You could take another one, rip it off. Ah! And you go, oh, oh, oh! You hear the dogs for miles. One dog hears another dog, and they're yelling. You can hear dogs all the way into Chicago barking. When you lay there for a while, reach up and grab another one. Ah! You pull it off, and there's a giant worm. Oh, you throw that one. Oh, boy, corn worms at 2 in the morning are really something. Oh, have you ever seen a tomato worm, any of you? Well, a tomato worm roughly is the size of a kosher pickle and roughly the same consistency. Uh, oh, boy. I'll never forget the time I, I, I dug my fork into a tomato worm <laughs> and a salad, but that's another story. <laughs> I just thought it was a very interesting kind of, of spiced pickle. Chop! I squirted off. Oh, you don't want to hear the rest of that. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm laying in there in the field with Schwartz and Flick and... and I guess it was a forerunner to going to war or something, because all of us later did. We're laying in the field, and, and we finally came back, and we had, a, we had a load of corn, we had a load of, of onions, and somebody said, what about the potatoes? Well, now, a potato is not quite like corn. You, you know how potatoes work? Potatoes don't grow above ground, for those of you who think they come in, in, in the in Gristides, you know. They don't come like that. They don't come fried. Uh, they just don't. A potato grows underground. See, it's, it's down there. You pull the plant up, and on the bottom of the plant is the potato, if you're lucky. It's like fishing. Well, so, so we said, well, what about, what, how are you going to do it? To pull the plants up? Because if you pull the plant up, that is a sure sign people have been out there. You can pull ears of corn off of off corn stalks, and no one knows it. You can pull up a few onions out of a onion set because they grow in great profusion. You don't have to pull the onions out. And, and you go up a row of onions and you can have enough onions till, till you know, you couldn't stand each other for years uh, with just one row and no one ever you know it. But a, 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 a potato is not quite the same. And so we're laying there looking at the potatoes. You can't make hunter's stew. The one ingredient they always talk about is diced potatoes. Cut the potatoes. And stuff, but the, oh, that's kind of the basis. So we're looking out there and it's dark. And the frogs are yelling, and the dogs are barking, and the bats are flying. And Schwartz says, watch. Schwartz crawls up forward, and, and uh, oh, another thing, potato plants are very low. Your silhouette is very, very high when you're, when you're stealing potatoes. You're much safer stealing corn, right, Jack? You're much safer stealing corn. They're very high, you can hide. But when you're stealing potato plants, your silhouette is silhouetted up against the moon, boy, and when you get a shot, a buckshot... Yeah. Oh, yes, did I? Uh, one other time we got shot with, with, uh, with salt. I'll tell you about that sometime. But here we are now crawling up the potato rows. Now, these little plants were just beginning. They were not really coming to fruition. These potato plants had probably another six weeks before they were even really, you know, potatoes. They were little, little baby potatoes. See? So Schwartz pulls one up, and hanging on the bottom of Schwartz's potato plant in the moonlight, he's laying flat. And I remember we're crawling forward on our gut, all four of us. He holds it up, and we look at this thing, and you can just see it there in the moonlight is a little tiny potato about the size of a marble, a little poor sand potato. And Schwartz looks at it, and he looks at Flick. Flick looks at me. I look at Bruner. And without a word, Schwartz takes that little potato, unk, pulls it off, digs his hand down, and replants the plant. Just like that, he pats it down, and we start crawling. Well, these are little tiny potatoes. These are little potatoes about the size, one third the size of a ping pong ball. You know, and it takes a lot because we were kids. We wanted a pot of hunter stew. We didn't want a little, you know, a little Dixie cup. We wanted a pot of hunter stew. So we started to crawl. 
Well, we crawled from one end of this poor guy's potato field to the other. Flat on our gut, each guy, we'd pull up the little plant and hold it up against the moon. You'd hold it up there, and you couldn't see anything except unless you held it up against the moon, and then you'd see this little round, little mib hanging there, you know. You'd go, pull it off. It's about the size of a cashew nut, you know. Put off another little one, and you put it back in the ground, and then we crawl forward again, and each one of us has got his pockets full of these little marbles, you know, <laughs> all over the place. Well, we reached the end of the field, and we had, we had pulled up every last one of this poor guy's potato plants and denuded it of the potatoes. Every last potato. So we crawled back, struggling, sweating. Oh, boy, it's hot, and the mosquitoes just were... We're each one gigantic mosquito bite, you know, just covered all over. We're crawling back. We're really living off the soil, you know. We're dragging our way through the mud, and you can hear, oh, 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 in the distance. Oh, oh. We'd lay there. Shh. Shh. And then you would hear Flick slowly crunk. For crying out loud, they're eating me up. Well, lay down, will you? Come on, you nut. You're going to get shot. We're laying there. We crawl forward, and the birds are slowly chirping. Occasionally, you'd, you'd, we'd kick up a, a meadow lark, and a meadow lark in the dark. There. Once in a while, we'd kick up a quail. Have you ever kicked up a quail? Two in the morning. Oh, my God. And you lay there. Well, we finally reached the edge of the field and back into the woods, and we were safe. We were home free now. And all the way home, corn we got we got onions we even got a couple of beets but we've got those rotten little potatoes and we got back into the shack we had this kerosene lamp we lighted up and for some reason or other as we opened up all these little things we lay them all out on our table i don't know there is something terribly pathetic about an immature potato nipped before toffinetti's even had a chance to audition it you know Little tiny potatoes. And we had this guy's entire potato crop piled up in front of us. This tiny, pathetic pile. We had stolen every one of us. I don't know what he thought. Six weeks later, when he went out to harvest his potatoes. Honey's damn plants! I've been doing nothing but killing the worms all the time! Look at this, Myrtle! Will you write to that burpee seed company that I've been had for the last time? Not a single rotten potato! Well, here we are. <laughs> eating his potatoes. Well... We get back to the pad, we've got all this stuff, and we suddenly realize, no meat. What's a hunter's stew without meat, you know? Hunter's stew. Bruner said he knew where there was a guy that had some pigs. Well, the next part of the story, I would suggest that if you are, if you are young, if you are innocent, you had better leave. Pork does not always come in the form of pork chops. It does not always come in the form of ribs at the Mandarin house. Well, ten minutes later, we are coming back from the back end of a, of a sad, smelly house, carrying in a gunny sack a little pig. A little pig fighting and struggling, and somebody's got a hold of his mouth. You know, we got this pig. And boy, I'll tell you, little pigs are tough. They're like, I'll tell you, they're like little angry footballs with feet. And yeah, they, they don't look like, they're not cute really. They don't look like Walt Disney things and they're bristly and they're, arr, they got teeth and they're fighting all the time. So we got this little pig and we're wrestling them back and we get them, we get them back in the place and we don't know what to do with them now. We've got this pig. Well, Schwartz and Flick go out in the back with their Boy Scout knife and their axe and they proceed to try to do what they thought you should do to a little pig to produce hunter's stew. Well, I am standing in the place. I'm supposed to be in charge of boiling the water and getting things ready. I am in there, and I hear this thump and this squealing and yelling outside in the dark. I go out with the flashlight, and there is Schwartz and Flick, and Bruner has now come out, and there was one of the most gory, wild, scary scenes you have ever seen in your whole life. Schwartz and Flick are trying... I, I, can't, I, I can't tell you any more about this, can I? I can't tell you any more about it, because all I know is that five minutes later, we are all going home, each one of us, in our own direction. We have buried the entire shlemu out in the back of the, of the pad. It's all there, gone, forgotten. I am home.
And I come in about 2.30 in the morning out of the Cretan bed, and I go off to sleep, and I have never mentioned it since.